Hello, everyone. This is Jeanette Gass from IASP, and I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar, A Global View on Disparities in Back Pain. Before we get started, I have a couple of notes um, to go over here on the screen. Uh, first off, uh, we'll have live Q&A at the end of the session. Um, please type your questions into the Q&A section of the Zoom meeting control panel window at any time. Um, presenters may answer their questions during their presentations um, as well. If you have general questions about a technical issue, questions about the webinar series or anything IASP related, please use the chat box and we'll respond to your questions there. After this webinar is over, a recording will be available on the IASP website and we will email all registrants um, with a copy of the recording. You can tweet using hashtag Global Year 2021 and follow at IASP Pain on Twitter. Uh, you can visit our website, iasp-pain.org slash Global Year for additional resources. Um, I'd also like to let you know that we soon be opening registration for the IASP 2022 World Congress on Pain um, happening next September in Toronto. And now I'd like to introduce our moderator, Dr. Manasi Tinti, who is at the University at the is in Australia um, and oh, studies sex and gender differences in back pain, and uh, she'll introduce our speakers. Thanks, Jeanette. I'm just going to share my slides. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the IS 2021 Global Year of Back Pain webinar, Disparities in Back Pain. I would like to begin uh, by acknowledging the Ghana people, traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today, and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I extend that respect to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people and First Nation people present here today. Myself, Mansi Murthy Mitinti, I'm a physician by training and a passionate advocate of equity in healthcare. Coming from a minority ethnic background from India, I have myself seen and experienced disparities in healthcare at different stages in life as a patient as well as a healthcare provider. So it is one of my personal mission to work for people who still remain underrepresented. I has advocated for this cause and it was a great opportunity to put a fact sheet together last year on the same topic of disparities in low back pain with Gabriella Page from Canada and Kobina D. Graf Johnson from Ghana. Today's webinar is another step forward and we will be hearing from eminent scientists who are striving for change and have made substantial contributions. As Jeanette has uh, already alluded, this webinar has been recorded and will be made available for attendees. I will also circulate key papers from all presenters so we can continue the conversation beyond today's webinar. Please feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box. I'll try my best to get through them. If we are unable to get through them, then I will circulate the response from the expert alongside the recorded webinar. So let's begin today's session. Our first way speaker is Associate Professor Sonia Bernardes uh, from the Institute of Lisbon, Portugal. I've had the privilege of working with Sonia since 2018. Uh, she has been recognized for her work and scientific merit by several national and international awards and has, has done great work in the disparities in healthcare and focuses on psychosocial in processes and how they influence chronic illness adaptation in the context of chronic pain. So let's start by hearing Sonia. Thanks, Sonia. Hello, my name is Sonia Bernardus, and um, today I'll be talking about sex, gender, and low back pain. So, according to the Global Burden of Disease of 2017, the global point prevalence of low back pain was 7.5%. And low back pain is indeed the leading cause of years lived with disability worldwide since 1990. Although less than one in three people have severely disabling chronic uh, low back pain, these account for 77% of all disability caused by this disease. 
So in a nutshell, low back pain is one of the major global health challenges today. So are there sex related differences in low back pain? And before I give you an answer to this question, let me just clarify that I will be using the term sex in this presentation as a merely descriptive term used to categorize human beings based on their sexual characteristics, such as chromosomes, hormones, external genitalia, and secondary characteristics, but with no underlying assumption of biological causality. So again, are there sex-related differences in low back pain? Indeed, there are. Again, the Global Burden of Disease study shows us that the age standardized point prevalence is a higher for women since 1990. And in 2017, as you can see here, it was around 8% for women and 6.9% for men. Years lived with disability are also higher for women than men overall. There are also sex-related differences in chronic low back pain. So chronic low back pain is more prevalent among women. Women tend to report more disabling chronic low back pain, which is more often associated to pain in multiple other sites. And women with chronic low back pain have lower odds of returning to work. So overall, women are at higher risk of developing persistent and disabling low back pain. But how can we account for these sex-related differences in chronic low back pain? We really need to have a biopsychosocial perspective to account for this pattern of differences. Some studies already show that we do have biological mechanisms, underlying mechanisms, which may account for sex-related differences in chronic low back pain and low back pain in general which might be related to sex hormones, the role of genetics, the immune or nervous system. As a psychologist in this presentation, I will be focusing on the role of psychological and social or psychosocial factors. Let me start with some of the psychological mechanisms which may account for these sex-related differences in chronic low back pain. We know uh, that uh, there are risk factors for prolonged disability and failure to return to work due to low back pain. And some are termed the so-called so orange flags. The orange flags are psychological or psychiatric disorders suggestive of diagnosable psych psychopathology, such as depression or anxiety disorders. Um, some of the yellow flags or so-called yellow flags are also risk factors associated with unhelpful pain-related cognitions, emotions, and behaviors such as pain catastrophizing or fear avoidance behaviors. So what evidence so far shows us is that women generally port more yellow and orange flags. So women tend to report more depression, anxiety, and anxiety sensitivity than men, and some study, studies actually suggest these are mediating mechanisms for clinical pain. And the, the same pattern exists for pain catastrophizing. Women report more pain catastrophizing than men, and studies suggest it is a mediating mechanism in clinical pain. Of course, if we stayed with the sex-related differences in psychological risk factors to account for sex-related differences in chronic low back pain experiences, we would run the risk of neglecting social and gender-related roots of such psychological mechanisms. And more importantly, we would run the risk of essentializing these differences. And we really don't want to do that. So that is why social factors such as gender or psychosocial factors such as gender are so important in helping us account for these differences. So gender is a, a big bundle of concepts 
uh, generally defined as the socially and culturally constructed meanings of being and acting as a man or a woman in a certain society and within a certain time frame. And these meanings account for the social and relational nature of sex related differences in general and in pain in particular. It will, would be out of the scope of this short presentation to completely unpack this big bundle, which is gender. So I will be focusing in this presentation on this particular uh, gender related construct, the pain related gender norms. There are uh, today, we have several empirical findings showing that most people have expectations regarding how men and women are or act when they're in pain. And we have these expectations or norms regarding several dimensions of pain experiences, which range from the types of pain to the way they behave or cope with pain or the types of relief strategies they use. Let me give you an example of uh, the types of pain or the gender types of pain, and in particular, low back pain. Is low back pain a gender type of pain? Some years ago, we did a study with lay people and nurses uh, and asked them in a free association task to think about common pains, which were more associated either to the typical man or the typical woman, to their representation of the typical man or woman. And regarding low back pain, what we found out was that back and musculoskeletal pain in general is clearly and more strongly associated to the representation of the typical man than that of the typical woman. It is still associated to the representation of the typical woman, but other types of common pains are more strongly associated to the representation of the typical woman, such as headaches, and pains associated to the urinary or reproductive uh, systems. Um, moreover, back pain in men was more associated to external causes such as injury or trauma. So pain was perceived as an intruder in men's bodies, whereas low back pain in women was more associated to internal causes, so it was naturalized in women's bodies. There are also pain-related gender norms regarding pain behaviors and pain coping, and an excellent uh, and more recent review of um, gender pain-related gender norms in healthcare context shows consistent um, patterns of norms occurring in different uh, cultural contexts. For example, generally people expect men in a healthcare context to try to tolerate pain, to deny talking about pain, to be stoic, uh, and even taking risks to hide pain and avoid, sometimes avoid seeking healthcare. The norms regarding women are very different. So women are described as being more sensitive than men to pain um, and more willing to report pain. Um, sometimes they're described as hysterical, malingerous, complaining and faking pain. And sometimes they're described as having pain that is inexplicable. So uh, pain that has no medically explained pain and has a poor fit to the traditional biomedical system. So as you can see here, we have very different norms uh, and they're not only different, but they're valued differently. Why are they not, these norms relevant? Of course, these norms are relevant because they can influence self-perceptions and create what we term gendered pain experiences. And again, some of its uh, review showed different emerging patterns in men and women's chronic pain experiences, musculoskeletal, but also low back pain experiences. So gender identity threat is an, a, a common theme emerging in men's experiences, um, most often associated with 
feelings of shame, irritation, grief, isolation, but also the theme of striving con to continue a normal life is uh, quite common and men try to uh, go to great lengths to avoid the loss of functionality, muscle strength, paid work, leisure, sports, which are important for their identities. They also uh, um, sometimes have this, some men also have this perspective of externalizing uh, their pain, their, their illness and, and the responsibility for care. So this perspective of this is not me. Whereas the themes emerging um, in women with chronic pain are a bit different. So they, they report pressure to maintain multiple roles, such as paid work, housework, being a spouse, a mother and informal care, which increases domestic strain. And they also have the sense of I have to learn, such as Samulovitz and colleagues termed it. So they adopt a more complex pattern of coping strategies also to um, cope with different pressures and they try and are told by health professionals to learn how to establish priorities and set limits to their surroundings and often the failure to manage these multiple roles is associated to self-blame. Pain-related gender norms can also influence perceptions of others and more particularly clinical encounters and we've done lots of uh, research years some years ago uh, in this regard and showed that these pain related gender norms can actually account for gender biases in pain care and we did several experimental studies with written vignettes uh, presenting cases of, of low back pain, where we manipulated not only the patient's sex, whether he, 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 the patient was a woman or a man, but also several clinical um, and contextual characteristics. And overall, what we found out was that some contextual characteristics may actually enhance the likelihood of women's low back pain being underassessed, such as the fact that when they present low back pain with no distress whatsoever, which is counter stereotypical, uh, or when pre they present a, a low back pain with medically, which is medically unexplained, or when they present acute low back pain instead of chronic low back pain. Uh, also, we've, we've shown that the assessment of women's low back pain is much more dependent on contextual cues, such as pain duration, uh, the levels of distress they present, or the absence or presence of medical evidence of pathology. And our findings go in line with the major themes found in literature, recent literature reviews that show that in clinical encounters, women struggle for legitimacy, so they often meet mistrust and invalidation, and their pain is more psychologized than men's pain, and they have to clearly manage their appearances, the way they present pain, in order to enter the sick world. So, sex and gender are clearly relevant to understand low back pain um, uh, experiences, is this knowledge being integrated in clinical guidelines and pain rehabilitation programs? Not yet. Um, so two very interesting reviews, more recent reviews have shown that um, a gender, on, on one hand, a gender analysis is scarce in rehabilitation programs for musculoskeletal chronic pain. Uh, and there are very few suggestions on how to integrate sex and gender in pain rehabilitation programs. And a very recent review by Rathbone and colleagues uh, of physiotherapy low back pain clinical practice guidelines all, also reached similar conclusions, so showing that most of these guidelines did not mention sex or gender. And there is a lack of sex or gender considerations which go beyond pregnancy related issues. So as a take home message, low back pain is a global challenge. There are important sex-related differences in global pain prevalence and burden. 
generally women are at higher risk of developing persistent and disabling low back pain. To understand this pattern of differences, we need to um, take into account biological, psych psychological and social factors. And gender is a very important construct to integrate and to account for the social and relational nature of this, these differences. By now, we have plenty of evidence supporting the existence of pain related gender norms. So people clearly expect men and women to be and act differently in public context when they're in pain. And these norms influence their pain experiences and also the clinical encounters. But this knowledge is not being yet um, uh, mainstreamed into pain rehabilitation programs and clinical guidelines, and this is an important way to go. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, Sonia. You're welcome. Let's move on to our next speaker, who is Professor Cheryl Banbe. Cheryl is a professor in the departments of medicine and community health science, Cummings School of Medicine, University of Calgary. She holds leadership roles at the university and also serves as vice chair for Indigenous Health in the Department of Medicine. Her research program focuses on equity in health service delivery and arthritis outcomes, more specifically for Indigenous populations in Canada. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, I will stop my share and let's hear Cheryl's talk. Thank you. Hello, bonjour. My name is Cheryl Barnaby, and I've been given the traditional name Wapakisa Siskiyou by Grandmother Doreen Spence. I'm a rheumatologist and a health services researcher here at the University of Calgary in Canada. We also call this place Mokinsis, and it is on Treaty 7 territory, which is home to the Blackfoot Confederacy, which includes the Siksika, the Bagani, and the Gainai Nations. It is also uh, the Sutina Nation, and uh, the three First Nations of the Stony Nakoda Nation, which include the Bears Paw, the Chiniki, and the Wesley. Mokinsis is also home to Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3, of which I'm a member, although I was educated and raised uh, in southeastern Manitoba along the Red River. It was an honor to receive the invitation to uh, provide this portion of the webinar today. I'll be speaking about the epidemiology impacts and health system disparities that exist for Indigenous peoples who experience chronic back pain. And there are approximately 5% of the global population who are recognized as being Indigenous. The experience of Indigenous peoples is that they are recognized as traditional owners or stewards of the land. However, settlers or colonial governments will come in, take those lands and enforce their own policies and legislation over it. Indigenous peoples, however, do have the right for self-determination, which includes the ability to identify who are members of those communities. And Indigenous peoples also self-identify as being members of a distinct culture or having distinct beliefs or speaking uh, unique languages. There are also established social, economic, and political, political structures in Indigenous communities. What unites Indigenous communities worldwide is that they have, for the most part, experienced colonization and removal or infringement of their human rights. Predominantly, this has been through loss of land or resources. And uh, in many examples, such as including here in Canada, culture has been suppressed. People have been assimilated uh, or attempted to be in assimilated and uh, also experienced widespread genocide. Uh, the day of this recording, in fact, is the first National Truth and Reconciliation Day we have here in Canada to recognize um, that um, people of Indigenous descent here in Canada 
have experienced uh, incredible loss because of colonial government policy. It's also Orange Shirt Day. Uh, we recognize that uh, there are many children who never returned home from residential schools and were uh, ex exposed to signi significant uh, mental and physical abuse. To this day, despite these being historic events or, or existing structures, uh, Indigenous peoples continue to face marginalization, discrimination, stereotyping, and racism in society which impacts many aspects of their well-being, but contributes directly to significant health inequities. Although there has been a declaration of human rights by the United Nations um, since the 1940s, uh, the rights of Indigenous peoples expressly uh, was only declared in 2007. We have several countries, including Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and America, where uh, there was refusal to adopt UNDRIPT, or significant delay in accepting it. However, specific to the talk today, it's important to recognize that UNDRIP does protect under Article 24, the right to traditional medicines and practices to maintain health, to be able to access social or health services without discrimination, and to enjoy highest attainable standard of physical and mental health. And this is at significant risk in communities where Indigenous peoples continue to experience exclusion and marginalization and racism. Now, specific to back pain, we're first going to talk about uh, prevalence of back pain. And I've mostly centered this around Canadian and Australian experiences, partly because of that being my knowledge, um, that being the knowledge of other people on this panel, but also because in many places we just do not have data that helps us to confirm what we assume are high rates of back pain everywhere else in the world for Indigenous peoples. In Canada, we have a First Nations Regional Health Survey that runs uh, approximately every three to five years. It is an on-reserve collection of data from people by other First Nations people. People self-report a diagnosis of back pain approximately 12% of the time here. And it is among the top five chronic diseases reported by people who participate in that survey. This is strikingly uh, similar to the experience for Indigenous Australians who also report an overall prevalence of back problems of 13%. Now, while the absolute prevalence is higher in Indigenous, pardon me, Indigenous Australians, uh, once there is age and sex standardization uh, relative to the non-Indigenous population, it is not thought to be at increased prevalence um, compared to the general population. However, again, is still highly prevalent. Not only are disease um, prevalence rates higher um, or high compared to other populations, we also see significant impacts of back pain. In Canada, there's a similar survey to the Regional Health Survey that is done for off-reserve uh, Indigenous peoples, which include First Nations, Métis and Inuit. And there's also a um, comparable survey done in the general population overall. Now, while this survey doesn't ascribe disability specific to a condition or disease, uh, we might assume that a pain-related disability, a flexibility-related disability, or a mobility related disability is probably in some part related to back pain or at least an arthritis condition. In these surveys, First Nations and Métis peoples do report higher rates of disability, and in particular, women are predominantly affected uh, relative to the non Indigenous population. One other way to look at the impact of back pain is through patient reports or qualitative research. Uh, which is what has been completed by my colleague, uh, Dr. Lin, who will be speaking next. His inquiry about the lived experience of pain uh, related to back conditions uh, is significant, with people reporting significant difficulties with completing or participating in activities of daily living, being able to remain employed, being able to participate in sport or other leisure activities that are important uh, in our communities, being able to travel, uh, which is really important when you're located very remotely and may need to access services 
um, to maintain your health, for example. And importantly, back pain significantly impairs the ability to participate in cultural activities. And why this is so important is that cultural continuity, cultural participation are all strongly linked to chronic disease rates, um, such as diabetes, as we saw in one report here in Alberta and Canada, as well as helping to protect against some other consequences, such as suicidality. Finally, uh, because of the impacts of intergenerational trauma, the significant losses that Indigenous peoples have faced, um, again, discrimination, genocide, um, there is significant overlap with distress and emotional impact for people um, that affects their ability to be a part of their families or sustain their, their societal roles. There are many potential reasons why back pain is increased in both prevalence, um, severity and impact in Indigenous populations. The first is that we see high rates of inflammatory back pain conditions, uh, for example, spondyloarthritis and closing spondylitis are all at increased prevalence. There's also an increased prevalence of osteoporosis. And of course, if people go on to have their fractures from osteoporosis, they will have resulting back pain as well. Indigenous peoples ex uh, experience high rates of injuries, whether those be through physical trauma, occupational injuries, or sporting injuries, and frequently do not have these appropriately addressed um, to prevent long-term consequences. I've mentioned intergenerational trauma, and this is something that has been described in multiple populations worldwide who've experienced genocide and cultural loss. This is where um, not only are the people directly affected by that event impacted, but their survivors, their remaining family members, the people that they give birth to and the people that they give birth to maintain these memories, they maintain these traumas, they maintain this sadness and grief around what has happened to them. And that imp impacts the ability to cope um, with and self-manage conditions such as back pain. Finally, um, we know that some of the conditions that predispose someone to chronic back pain are at increased frequency. This can be related to some lifestyle factors, but ultimately the root causes of all of those conditions are inequities in social determinants of health. And that includes appropriate healthcare service access. So let's um, talk about what happens at the systemic level when people do try to access healthcare. The first is that we have very westernized health systems that are set up for the general population. Their funding structures tend to not value Indigenous populations, or they do not put the necessary resources in to deliver the same amount of service because of geographic uh, distribution, remoteness, um, or um, difficulties with understanding how to make sure that there aren't policies that overlap or conflict with each other. For example, here in Canada, we have uh, federal benefits for health, which uh, are partially supporting patients, but um, each province is receiving a health service transfer um, to deliver the actual care. And this leads to jurisdictional disputes about who pays for what, because not every province will cover everything compared to another. We also have huge issues with racism in healthcare systems and people trying to access these systems do not feel safe in doing so. This leads people to toughing out, uh, accessing necessary care, or they will prioritize the most absolute dire conditions um, to be addressed over other comorbidities that they may have. We also experience um, very low penetration or in integration of traditional healing practices in our health system. It's actually very rare for a hospital, for example, to have uh, serve to serve traditional foods to patients, um, is very rare to see traditional medicines incorporated in formularies, or some of the um, practices such as elders being included in the healthcare system as a mechanism of support for patients. Those are very infrequently occurring here in Canada, at least. And so we don't also encourage people to pursue these things because we don't know them. We can't offer them. And um, it is seen as something that is outside of what our healthcare system should provide or fund. 
We also know that having Indigenous people represented in the healthcare workforce is incredibly important to patient safety and um, feeling that they are welcomed and belong. And so we have uh, a huge issue with having adequate education on reserve um, or people seeing healthcare as a place where they want to work, again, because of the negative experiences that people have had within our healthcare systems. Finally, uh, we can't improve what we don't measure. And most of the times our quality improvement metrics are very rudimentary. They don't reach Indigenous peoples to understand the experiences they've had in the healthcare system. And they also uh, do not address the determinants or the values that Indigenous patients have when receiving their health care. So we can't properly address what we aren't doing appropriately if we don't know what those things should be because we haven't bothered to measure them. I'd also like to just say that we uh, face a lot when trying to come to a system when we're not feeling well as it is. It's difficult to be self-advocates uh, when you're not yourself. And those are overlaying uh, with multiple societal factors where people will experience uh, racism and discrimination when trying to uh, access appropriate care. I'm now going to pass this on to Dr. Lin, who is going to share some promising interventions and health service ways of ensuring Indigenous patients can access appropriate cultural services. Thank you. Thanks, Cheryl. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to our next speaker, who is Dr. Ivan Lin from Western Australia. I think the right introduction for Ivan would be the champion of um, Aboriginal healthcare in Western Australia. He works as a rural physiotherapist with the Geraldton Regional Aboriginal Medical Service, but also as a senior lecturer at the University of WA. His specialty is musculoskeletal pain management in primary and emergency care in the Aboriginal healthcare system and was recently uh, listed as top 10 musculoskeletal pain researchers internationally and ranked second in Australia. So thank you, Alvin, for joining us today. I will stop my share and get your presentation going. Hello, thank you for tuning in to this presentation. Um, thank you also, also to my co-presenters and to Manasi for coordinating this session. Um, so my name is Ivan Lin. I work as a physiotherapist and as a researcher based in Geraldton, Western Australia. And what I'll be talking about uh, are some cut examples of some of the work we've been involved with here to try and reduce some of the disparities um, in, in back pain. So I'm just going to share my screen to get started. Okay, so to begin, firstly, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners, so the Yamaji people, uh, because all the work I'm presenting today has been in partnership um, with Yamaji friends, colleagues and community members. So I just want to um, acknowledge and pay my respect to um, elders past, present, future and emerging. I thought a good place to start today would be in the way of a video, because it illustrates some of the reasons um, why that I've been involved with this work. So this video, this video here is about five years old. And this man, Aboriginal man, um, 10 years before this video was taken, he was working on a remote station, um, about three or four hours inland, of where I am now, and he was crouching down, um, working on something at ground level, I think on some articulation, and he felt a searing pain in his back and down his leg. He said he thought he'd been hit by lightning. That was what he described it as. And so he was bundled up um, into, put on the back of a, um, a, a truck, um, driven into the local nursing post. From there, he was put on an ambulance, in an ambulance, and then driven to the nearest regional hospital, and then he was flown to the city um, and all he remembers back then was this you know them being told it's a spinal and he spent six weeks initially in hospital back then and he says during that time in hospital 
you know, people didn't talk to him about what was going on. He didn't really make any strong connections with any of the health practitioners down there. He had a number of investigations, um, MRI and, and, um, and other investigations, none of which was anything was explained to him. When I first saw him um, some time ago, um, he had a couple of back surgeries. Like his belief was that, you know, these surgeries were failing and his back must be crumbling down um, because he still had all this tremendous amount of pain. Um, you know, he was taking a whole cocktail of medications. Um, and really, you know, if you look at him leaving there, he's, he's, he's highly avoidant of using his left leg. He's not confident at all. Basically, he had no active management strategies for him to look after his, his pain. Everything was sort of related to this, this medicalised approach to pain. And so I think his, his story, I think, in particular, um, illustrates why it's important to think about the way that we're doing business, you know. Um, for an Aboriginal man like this who is on a disability pension, who's unable to work, I often reflect back and think, had things been done differently back then, whether or not he might be in a better position now. So I'll, I'll sort of return to his story a bit later on. So let's move on. So. Here's just a general sort of um, model, if you like, of some possible steps to look at um, enhancing um, back pain amongst First Nations people. And some of these Cheryl has already spoken to. So if we can think of, you know, if we wanted to look at, if we were to address um, all the factors which would be um, useful for improving back pain, you know, there's multi-level. So at a societal level, we know there are cult so social cultural determinants of back pain. We know experiences of discrimination, discrimination and racism. We know, we know that people's opportunities that they have access to, all these things can influence um, you know, back pain. But the health system, funding considerations, the cultural security and safety of the healthcare system, uh, workforce and training of First Nations staff, as well as non-First Nations staff to work better in, in that area. Um, quality systems with uh, First Nation identified quality indicators. At a health service level, you know, what sort of care partnerships there are, and so on and so forth. So there's a whole variety of different levels you can work at. Now, I guess I wanted to point this out because what I'm going to be talking about is very much some strategies at the clinician level um, and some things we've, we've tried to do to, which can be put into everyday practice. And specifically, I'm going to focus on two things. First of all, I'm going to focus on a project which we developed culturally appropriate low back pain information for Aboriginal Australians. Um, the second project is a project which looked at improving communication, and that's called clinical yarning, which is the model we developed. So firstly, let's go to the first one, which is the culturally appropriate low back pain information. So this project is called My Back on Track, My Future. So the origins of this project was some qualitative re research we did a number of years ago, where we interviewed Aboriginal people with, with persistent low back pain. And we were a little bit surprised because we found that this was people in sort of regional areas and also very remote areas. And what we found is that people tend to have these unhelpful beliefs about pain, like, like these ones displayed here. So, you know, you show me the x-ray and I've got arthritis. It's bone crunching on bone. You know, I'm going to end up in a wheelchair. It doesn't matter what happens. Sort of thing. And the people who are more disabled, who had more contact with the healthcare system, had more of these unhelpful beliefs which had come from healthcare practitioners. And so we published a paper where we talked about the way that iatrogenic healthcare practices might be impacting negatively. So this is the sort of um, beliefs and information we wanted to challenge, we wanted to address and give people some alternatives, um, not, not just around this sort of very medicalised approach to persistent back pain. So in the My Back on Track, My Future project, um, there are essentially four main steps, um, and I'll go through each of them, each of them now. So the first step, the first couple of steps were firstly to identify low back pain messages, and we did that because uh, from our qualitative research and from clinical practice guidelines. Then we took those messages and we developed them into five stories, so five narratives. And to do that, we worked with we had an Aboriginal um, uh, reference group comprised of Aboriginal community members and health workers. And so we workshop these um, messages into sort of five scenarios and, and wrote them out as, as scripts. 
um, for five stories to illustrate each of the messages. We then filmed these stories uh, with community actors. And I say community actors, these were community people who we essentially asked to be actors and, and who has, and had some obvious skill at acting, um, but certainly not professionals. And we, we filmed um, these uh, five different scenarios and each of these scenarios um, was for a different sort of message and, and a different demographic. We had some for some young people, we had some for some community elders, and so on. Um, and those are available on the link at the bottom of, of underneath uh, um, the, the script there. After, I'll, um, what I'll do is show you just a quick snippet of one of those, um, of those videos now. And I'll start it a little bit way along. Yeah. I haven't seen you around here for a while. Yeah. You gonna come out for a kick or what? Yeah, the stuff in the back up. Had an x ray on it. They reckon I got degeneration and arthritis. I hurt my back last year at work. Had an x ray on it. The doctor said I had degeneration and arthritis in it. Both the doctor and physio said that this was pretty normal. Exercise was the best thing for it. You mean I could play footy now? Oh, well, not right now. You'd have to get a second opinion and probably see a physio and try and set up a plan. I got that second opinion and all those big medical terms they mean damage. I don't want to be sidelined again, but so that was obviously a video um, about that very message about having a being told you've got arthritis and all the um, at a young age and that relating to a negative, negative future and negative outcome that was inevitable. Um, so we then undertook a, an evaluation of this of this project. So we just were interested to know how this compared to more traditional forms of information. So, um, so what we did was we um, we compared uh, the my back on track, my future videos to what was recommending clinical guidelines, which was the back book, and we asked twenty Aboriginal adults to look at both, uh, or look at each of the resources, and we interviewed them after they'd uh, looked at each one. Um, one of the things we asked them was who preferred what. So we found that 13 of the 20 preferred My Back on Track, four preferred the back book, two both, and one didn't really like either of them. So I guess the first lesson was that you obviously have to customise the information you give people to the individual because, you know, some people have different preferences. But I guess the majority of people preferred the My Back on Track, My Future resources. So then what we did was we, in our qualitative and came up with a number of different themes and these these quotes highlight I suppose the general themes that came out so first of all I like to see local Aboriginal people in there like old people my age we talk like that to each other every day there were no big words the doctors used but we concluded from that that our, um, our resource was useful because it circumvented some of the issues we know um, there are in, in terms of communication and sort of so that's the My Back on Track, My Future resource. And as I said, those web, those, um, web resources are available if you want to look at them. The second project I want to talk about now is relates to um, communication and some strategies to improve communication called clinical yarning. So the origins of this project was, again, a qualitative study we did a number of years ago um, with people with persistent low back pain. One of the strong themes that came out were, was this issue of communication. So you can see from these two quotes, that really, you know, people are receiving healthcare and not really getting a, a, a strong idea of, of what happened, even in the case of surgery. You know, so they're not getting an explanation that helps them understand what's going on or helps them to 
to, to, to look after their bat. Um, a couple of years ago, we did a systematic review and we found that communication between healthcare practitioner and patient was a pretty significant theme. And so one of the things we found was um, communication could be used as a way not only to improve the quality of services, but to improve accessibility. So a group of uh, my colleagues and I, we developed a model of communication, which we call clinical yarning. So yarning, um, I'm sure many people here will understand what it is, but um, yarning is a term used by Aboriginal people that really refers to um, having a conversation in a relaxed and informal way. It tends to be a two-way conversation where information is shared and where power is sort of even. There's many different types of yarns you can have. You can have yarns about what's been going on in general. You can have yarns about all, all sorts of topics, but we talk about clinical yarning as a yarn with a purpose. And it has three parts. So clinical yarning has the social yarn, the diagnostic yarn, and the management yarn. So what we talk about is trying to reconceptualize traditional clinical communication, which tends to be quite health practitioner centric, and to make it a little bit more friendly for patients and to improve the quality of information. So I'm going to talk about what each of these different parts are, and I'll go to this, this depiction, which is a Yamaji representation painted by my colleague Wanda Flanagan. So firstly, the social yarn. So, so the social yarn is really about when getting to know the patient. So it's really um, it's really for the patient to get to know you, for you to get to know the patient, to demonstrate to the patient that they're interested in them as a person as opposed to their pain or condition. It often happens at the start of a consultation, but not always. It's, it, this whole idea of clinical yarning is that it's patient-led. And so the sort of skills that are needed for the social yarn is firstly to introduce yourself respectfully. Um, the other skills might be uh, to share some information about yourself, to find some common ground, um, if there's, um, if you can, if there's something, if you can use humour, that's often a nice way of associating or, or breaking the ice. Um, sometimes it's helpful to demonstrate interest and some awareness of Aboriginal culture. Um, for example, a sociaan might be someone comes in and you, you know, how, how are you going? Um, you know, it could be about the weather. You know, isn't it? Hasn't it been wet lately? Hasn't it been hot lately? What have you been doing? Oh, I've been doing and, and, and so on. Um, so the social is a way of just sort of making a person feel comfortable and breaking down some of those initial barriers. Now, the diagnostic yarn is when, when health practitioners gather all of that information needed to make clinical decisions. So often this happens in a sort of like a, a question answer sort of way, and, and this is probably not the way we, we would encourage. So the diagnostic yarn is much more conversational. It favours a more an open-ended questioning style of conversation and very engaged listening. Um, we strongly encourage reflective communication strategies like validation, um, summarising, clarifying, prompting, these sorts of things. And so it's when all that clinical information is gathered, you're filtering it as it comes in, you're filtering it through all the information to make a clinical decision, um, but in a much more conversational and friendly, friendly way. Um, the final part of clinical yarning model is the management yarn. So in the management yarn, the whole idea is if you, if someone understands what's, what's going on, what's, what's happening in terms of their health, then what they need to do makes sense to them and so they're more likely to do it, it makes sense. And so the management yarn is make, making sure, firstly, that health, is, health information is explained in a way that's contextually meaningful for the person. And then on the basis of that, coming to some management plans together. That's the whole, that's the whole basis of clinical yarn, management yarn. Um, so we've got a, currently got a trial of um, implementing clinical yarning. We've done, we've done some work with clinical yarning and evaluated it from the, from the perspective of healthcare practitioners um, here in Western Australia and had some very sound and very good feedback. We currently have um, a project underway with some colleagues in Queensland. Um, from QIMR in Queensland, Queensland Health, um, looking at implementing clinical yarning or clinical yarning workshop and cultural capability workshop in three pain management units in Queensland. So hopefully we'll have the results for that um, closer to the end of the year. Um, so that's the clinical yarning model. So can, clinicians can really, um, you know, can, can learn about this model and try and adapt some of the, the processes in clinical yarning as one tool um, to improve the clinical communication. 
All right, so I want to return to the story of this fellow now. So this story was taken a couple of years ago now. Um, so this is the fellow I showed at the beginning. And what he's doing here is coming into the gym program at the Aboriginal Medical Service that I work in. So he'd been coming, when this video was taken, he'd been coming for about a year. So we engaged him in his care and we explained his pain problem um, in, a, in a much more sort of contemporary way and in, in a way he can understand. We, we got to know him through clinical yarning. Um, we, we had some yarns with him and those yarns are really targeting, reconceptualising the idea that his pain problem is not just about the failure of you know, the structures in his back, but he has a, he has a sensitised system. Um, he, has some, he has some nerve damage that's ongoing in his leg, which is causing some pain but he's been very avoidant of using the leg and as a result, the leg is very weak and deconditioned. And so he's been working in the gym at a gym program, really, and you can see very mindfully, to try and uh, get his body going again. And he's been doing general exercises and he's been doing very targeted exercises to improve his movement of his back and to improve his awareness of his back and to improve the strength and control of his left leg. Um, and as an example, when he first began this program, he was unable to balance on his left leg. And now he can stand there equal to the right. And you can see he's very thoughtful about and very mindful of the way he's doing his exercises, he's about what his body's doing. And so he's, he said that the, he gave some feedback when we, did, when we um, filmed this video. And he said, I mean, the best thing from his perspective was that now he knew what he could do for himself. And that no matter what he, what he how he feels when he goes into the gym, he comes out feeling better. And whilst his pain, you know, is still quite severe and quite strong pain, he's able to do a lot more with his life. That's all based on, you know, developing good communication with him, providing him information in terms that he can understand, such as the Mind Back on Track my Future Resource. So in conclusion, I just really want to emphasize just that there are multiple level, multi-level contributors um, to back pain and um, what we focused on today is just some things that clinicians can do um, to their practice and so we focused in particular on um, the sort of information provided and so the my back on track my future resources very much a partnership between um, a team of us um, including first nations um, uh, clinicians community members and and others um, the second area, of course, is communication. And the clinical yarning is just one tool uh, that we hope helps clinicians communicate more effectively uh, with Aboriginal patients. So just to finish, I want to acknowledge the work I present today is, is the result of collaborations um, with all of these people and my email is there for people who would like to get in contact. So I'll stop sharing there. Thank you very much. I look forward to some questions and further discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Ivan, for the talk. Thanks, Monty. Thank you. Moving on to our final presenter for today, Professor Paulo Ferreria, who, who is uh, NHMRC Research Fellow at the Charles Perkinson Center at University of Sydney. Paulo is one of the world leaders in the field of low back pain. And if I, I should mention here that a strong leadership in promoting multidisciplinary approach in clinical studies. For example, one of the research that we have recently collaborated on is we are examining if provision of social support along with physical activity and exercise does change the outcome for individuals who experience low back pain. So, very, very strong leadership in this field. And he has uh, received several international and national awards and has published in internationally leading journals like the Lancet, BMJ, Annals of Internal Medicine. Thank you so much, Paolo, for joining us today. I'm going to stop my share and start with your presentation. Okay, um, I hope the um, technology is working and the recording um, is working properly. Um, I, I'm here to 
discuss a little bit with um, with the conference attendees and, and the rest of the group um, some aspects of physical activity and how to harness the effects of physical activity to try to bridge the disparities in, in low back pain. And um, I will use a, an example of some case in, in Australia and some data that we have in Australia from rural populations. I would like to sincerely uh, thank the organization of the conference for accepting um, this webinar. And um, I'm, it, is, it is an honor uh, for me to participate in this, um, in this group. Um, I would like to start by acknowledging the tradition of custodianship and law of the country on which here in Australia, the University of Sydney campus stand. Um, and we pay our respects to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who have cared uh, so well and continue to care um, for the country. So I just a little bit of context to, to start with, just trying to set up you know, the scene and, and, and a little bit of background in, in the problem of back pain. Um, and with a special focus of rural communities. Um, we know that low back pain um, affects one in six Australians, and it is still the highest contributor to disability in the world. And, and this is data from the GBD study, um, the most recent one, which used data from 1992 to 2019. Um, of course, this is when disability is assessed as the number of years that people live with a disability. On a more personal note, back pain is a huge burden uh, for people to bear. It limits people's work and leisure time, um, and it significantly affects the quality of the relationship of, of sufferers and, uh, and leads to serious problems of mental health. Um, this is a, um, um, a little bit of fresh data um, on the burden of, of the disease um, and data up to 2019. Uh, the interesting thing now is that um, we are seeing the peak prevalence of back pain getting affecting more and more um, older people. So I remember when we were teaching students in class and we used to say that the peak of back pain um, was around the age of 45. And, and when we see um, these recent data now, we can actually see that the peak has significantly shifted towards um, the older population. And it does affect females more than males. And a little bit of um, a, um, a map of the prevalence of the disease. And we can see um, you know, certain special place in Europe and North America where the prevalence of back pain um, is really, really high. Um, the other issue associated with back pain, when we, um, when we look at um, you know, the, uh, the background of the disease and, and the impact of the disease really, is that um, a lot of people think that back pain is just you know, some, some discomfort in, in, in the spine. Um, and uh, so we managed to um, conduct this study a few years ago when we looked at back pain as a um, predictive factor for all cause and cardiovascular specific mortality. And we use data from uh, Danish twins um, with spinal pain. And, um, and what we found was that um, on average, people with spinal pain have 13% higher chance of dying every year um, compared to those people with no spinal pain. So there is a, a significant important increase in probability of dying on people who actually suffer from, um, from spinal pain. Um, a little bit more into you know, rural communities and, and how we can actually support those communities to be um, um, to be more healthy in terms of um, spinal pain and back pain. Um, for those who live in a rural community in Australia, this situation is uh, worse than those who live in a major city. So back pain is 23% 23, uh, 23 more prevalent in rural uh, communities in Australia 
people need to travel significant distance to access proper care. Um, and, um, and some people need to travel up to 700 kilometers to access health service uh, to, uh, to manage back pain. And, um, and that's not to say that it's the best available service, just the distance to that first point of contact. Um, travel costs to manage musculoskeletal pain in Australia is significant, and it has been estimated to be seven, eight million dollars annually. So just that cost for people to actually travel and access proper care can be significant as well. So um, something um, should be done and it needs to be done. Um, linked to the issue of back pain and one of the main focus of this talk is um, physical activity and getting people to move in the proper way to try to manage back pain. And uh, one of the things that um, we managed to, to do um, recently was to look at how physically active people are in rural communities, really, because there is this assumption that, you know, if you live rurally, um, you are actually much more physically active and um, you are engaging more physical activity compared to, um, you know, to people in urban areas, because if you live rurally, guess what, you're going to be walking a lot and, you know, you're going to be healthy and so on. And so we did a systematic review recently, and this is the work of my PhD student, Carlos. Um, we look at every single study that compare um, the prevalence of physical inactivity um, on the levels of physical activity in people living uh, rural, rurally uh, compared to those living um, in major cities. And so every single study that provided data on physical activity directly comparing um, rural versus urban population, uh, we were able to retrieve. And so this is the pooled estimate of physical inactivity. Um, and what we managed to see was that, in fact, the prevalence of physical inactivity or sedentaries is actually higher in people who live in a rural community. Um, it's not too much different, it's not too much um, higher compared to those living in urban areas, but it is higher. And as opposed to what a lot of people would think that, um, you know, if you live um, rurally, you would probably be less, um, not be as physically inactive really compared to those in um, urban areas. So it's, um, it's a kind of a myth actually to assume that people who live in rural areas uh, will be physically active really. Um, this is a, um, an interesting piece of data. We, this is the work that we are, um, we just finished and, and it's currently under review. Um, and again, it's the work led by my PhD student, Carlos. Um, we managed to pull every single study that compared the prevalence of musculoskeletal pain in um, rural communities. Um, and compare the prevalence to urban communities. So it's a major systematic review. And uh, so we were able to pull every single international study that had a direct comparison of the prevalence of musculoskeletal pain um, between urban and rural communities. So here you can see the difference in prevalence um, of uh, urban versus rural. Um, and quite, um, uh, quite, um, it's quite a, a tendency really to see that the prevalence of um, musculoskeletal pain tends to be slightly higher in those people living rurally. So the little tree here is the legend for people living rural um, and the opposite for, um, and this little building here is for people living in urban areas. So um, with some, um, some difference across the board, but um, the overall tendency is that the prevalence of musculoskeletal pain tends to be a little bit higher um, in those people living rurally. And um, what we've done is we also managed to, um, to pull the results um, of um, back pain. And, and so this is a global comparison of low back pain in rural 
um, versus urban populations. So um, this particular um, piece of data is on back pain only. And you can see the number of studies that we were able to pull. And um, these are all global studies from all over the globe. And what we found was that the prevalence of back pain, the odds of having back pain is significantly higher in those people living in rural settings compared to those in urban settings. However, we repeat the same exercise, but this time we look at the prevalence of care seeking um, for musculoskeletal pain. And what we found was actually the opposite from that previous data um, in a sense that the odds of uh, seeking care for musculoskeletal pain were, were actually lower for people living in rural areas. So it does appear that although the prevalence of back pain is higher in rural populations, the prevalence of care seeking for um, those communities is actually smaller. So those people are not Um, between urban and rural communities. So here you can see the difference in prevalence um, of uh, urban versus rural. Um, and quite, um, uh, quite um, it's quite a, a tendency really to see that the prevalence of um, musculoskeletal pain tends to be slightly higher in those people living rurally. So the little tree here is the legend for people living rural um, and the opposite for people living in urban areas. So um, with some, um, some difference across the board, but um, the overall tendency is that the prevalence of musculoskeletal pain tends to be a little bit higher um, in those people living rurally. And um, what we've done is we also managed to, um, to pull the results um, of um, back pain. And, and so this is a global comparison of low back pain in rural um, versus urban populations. So um, this particular uh, piece of data is on back pain only. And you can see the number of studies that we were able to pull. And um, these are all global studies from all over the globe. And what we found was that the prevalence of back pain, the odds of having back pain is significantly higher in those people living in rural settings compared to those in urban settings. However, we repeat the same exercise, but this time we look at the prevalence of care seeking um, for musculoskeletal pain. And what we found was actually the opposite from that previous data um, in a sense that the odds of uh, seeking care for musculoskeletal pain were, were actually lower for people living in rural areas. So it does appear that although the prevalence of back pain is higher in rural populations, the prevalence of care seeking for um, those communities is actually smaller. So those people are not really accessing the same number of care or the same quality perhaps um, of, um, of um, care for the management of back pain, which is quite interesting. It might be an issue of access really. Um, and we suspect that that's, that's the issue uh, running here. Um, the, the problem with back pain is that 
we have a lot of treatments really and um, and a lot of those treatments are not really helping significantly this is just an example that we can see here it's it's the efficacy of um, injections for sciatica and um, and as we can see here, the pooled effect size for um, corticoid steroid injections for the manage of, management of sciatica are really, really low and perhaps not clinically significant. Now, I, um, for a purpose, I, I decided to uh, cite this study, and, and, um, and that's a study that we've done in the past. And, and the reason why I chose injections was because we were surprised to see how many people we had to exclude from our clinical trials in Australia um, in rural settings because they had an injection in the previous three months. And I will cite some of those clinical trials um, in a second. So it's really common for people in rural areas to have uh, injections um, in their spine because of back pain. Um, and we think that the prevalence is actually higher than uh, urban areas. Um, and we know that this particular procedure is not particularly effective. Um, now, moving to the other side of, of the spectrum, we know that physical activity can actually help people with, um, with back pain. Um, and so those that are physically active actually have a better chance of recovering um, compared to those who are sedentary. Um, so we know that physical activity is probably beneficial. Most types of physical activities, actually, um, we're not going to dive into that now, but um, um, definitely the um, meeting the uh, guidelines for leisure physical activity tends to be beneficial for back pain. And uh, the benefits of physical activity are being promoted. So in the recent Lancet series that we um, that we, we published, we are making a case that, you know, exercise therapy and physical activity is um, strongly recommended for the management of back pain. So it's not that the message is not there, you know, we are trying to spread the message that exercise and physical activity um, are important. But when we go to the clinical guidelines, and, and this is a series of um, clinical guidelines all over the globe that we managed to, um, to use in this study. And we look at the quality of the recommendations for physical activity. Um, what we are seeing is that um, the clinical guidelines quite frequently mention supervised exercise for the management of back pain. But it's really rare for those um, guidelines to actually recommend physical activity as a form of self-management. So this is an example uh, of uh, how poorly the guidelines recommend physical activity in general. Um, so this is from the UK guidelines. They're saying you know, that they encourage people with chronic pain to remain physically active, but there is not much information on how much they should do what type of physical activity they should engage. Um, and so we are facing the situation that, you know, those people live in rural areas, particularly in Australia, they are not as physically active as we think. Um, um, and they, we know the benefits of physical activity for back pain. We're trying to spread the word, but we still need to translate that information and uh, educate people. So I'm just going to share with you a piece of work that we've done recently. Um, it is a knee health um, study, um, um, clinical trial where we delivered the um, um, a knee health intervention to help people in rural Australia to exercise more. Um, and we, our main aims was to investigate the feasibility of the program um, and to estimate the effectiveness of, of this e-health physical activity program to improve people's physical function and people had to live rurally to participate in this trial. Um, so just a, bit, um, um, a brief overview of the trial, we recruited 156 participants, they had to have low back pain or a knee osteoarthritis and we collected a bunch of measures from them at baseline and then we randomized them to a knee health group so they would receive an exercise program and a physical activity plan all delivered online with a, an, an electronic platform and we compared that to the usual care group 
um, and so the usual care is basically um, they would continue doing whatever they were doing, um, whether they were seeing a GP or using pain medication or actually seeing a physiotherapist face to face, um, that was considered our usual care group. Um, now, we just finished analyzing the three-month follow-up data, and I'll, I'll just share one, one, uh, the main outcome uh, with you today. Um, and we're still waiting for the six-month data to, um, to arrive so that we can do the full analysis. Um, so in terms of recruitment distribution, we are lucky to recruit from all over Australia. Um, and, uh, but the greatest majority of patients came from New South Wales. But we had patients from participants from Tasmania, from the territories. Uh, so we were really happy with that. Um, the main outcome of the trial uh, was patients' functional levels. And we assessed function with the patient-specific function scale. Uh, which range from zero to 30. So this is the comparison between the e-health and the usual care group. Um, so they started pretty much from um, the same baseline values. And we saw this um, significant increase in, in function in the e-health group um, and not as much in the, um, in the usual care group. Uh, now, the difference uh, using a linear mixed um, regression model adjusted for um, relevant um, covariates was uh, 3.7 points on the functional scale with a confidence interval of 1.4 to 5.9. Uh, from my statistical uh, point of view, it was significant. The minimal clinical worthwhile effect as per our protocol was three. So um, this difference uh, made the cutoff for us to consider these clinical, these effects clinically relevant. Um, and this is just a, a, some measures of patient satisfaction with that e-health physical activity program. Um, and as we can see here on, on a zero to 10 scale, um, the participants were usually very satisfied with um, most measures of satisfaction of, uh, with the program. Um, in terms of feedback, this is, this is qualitative um, data really, you know, it's just a one of the participants that sent this to, uh, to the health coach who delivered the, uh, the intervention and just saying, you know, this is a picture of my walking companion. And he's basically thanking the health coach uh, for, for the intervention. So just in terms of final uh, remarks, I'll, I'll, be, uh, I'll be happy to accept uh, questions as they come. Um, so people living in rural settings, settings are not necessarily more physically active than those living in major cities. Um, low back pain is more common in rural areas, um, perhaps more severe, but access to evidence-based care is difficult for those people. Um, now, Potentially digital health and telehealth solutions are promising to support those people to engage in what we consider adequate physical activity programs um, in low back pain in, in rural settings. Patients are likely to accept these digital health solutions and, and possibly to engage based on the data from our clinical trials. Um, so I'd like to, uh, to finish by thanking the NHMRC uh, for uh, supporting my research and the Medibank Foundation for um, supporting uh, the clinical trial that we did um, with rural, Australia's, uh, rural Australians. Um, and um, with that, I thank you a lot for your time and attention, and I think I'll be taking some questions um, from now on. Thank you very much. Thanks, Paulo. We have one question for you. Uh, what consideration was given to internet access for e-health program? This question has come through for Paulo. Yeah, so we, we basically rolled out the, the program to anybody who had some level of connectivity um, and, um, and, and literacy with um, you know, with, with computers and, and the technology as well. Um, now we did come across some issues with, with the quality of, and, and the speed of connection. Um, and when that happened, we, we had to come back to some more simple solutions using, you know, just telephone or 
um, asking participants to come to the closest point of contact in small uh, town, towns to have the telehealth um, um, session delivered to them. So internet connectivity is one of the biggest challenges that we have for proper digital health and, and e-health programs for people in rural areas. Um, and so sometimes we come across these limitations in, in what we call big towns in, in New South Wales. Um, Orange, for example, is, is a big town close, you know, close to Sydney. And sometimes we have issues when we have Skype conference and, and Zoom conference. So it is, it is, it is an issue. Thank you. I mean, there's a question for you. Um, have you had or do you expect problems in getting primary health care providers to take on such a change in how they communicate with patients? That for me? Yes. No, yeah. that for Ivan. That's for Ivan. Oh, yeah, you're sorry. Um, well, I think it's really challenging, changing behaviours, as anyone here would know. Um, I think, um, yeah, I mean, I think the evidence uh, from, you know, patient-centred communication uh, changes would say that, you know, it needs to be reasonably high dose of training, uh, if that's the main intervention, um, and that a large part of that training needs to be experiential. Um, so people need to practice you know, communicating, receive some feedback, reflect on that, you know, rehearse for, you know, what they might do differently next time and then repeat it. And this needs to happen on an ongoing basis. Um, one of the things about um, I mean, clinical yarning is, is that um, you know, we need to have, it, it's very much a partnership model. It needs to have um, you know, facilitators who are First Nations people with you know, cultural knowledge, uh, needs to have facilitators with clinical knowledge. Um, and so, yeah, I think it, it's about sort of getting all these enablers in place. Um, it's about having uh, primary care providers who are at the right stage um, and are reflective about their communication. Um, I think as Cheryl mentioned as well, you know, having some metrics which really do highlight uh, First Nations people's experiences of healthcare would be very very handy uh, because mm. that would enable you know, these sort of things to be measured and understood a lot more. Um, and, you know, that, that, that's very important as well as other, as other outcomes. So yeah, I think it's challenging. I think it's certainly doable, um, mm. but I think it needs quite an intensive dose. Mm. Sure. Cheryl, is there something that you would like to add to Evan's response? Yeah, we've also led some uh, co uh, continuing medical education interventions for rheumatologists, and that was based on a program developed for family physicians. It is intense um, to run those sessions. They're very interactive. It involves role playing. Uh, so you need a small number of participants uh, to make it work. And uh, I think there are some challenges. We've done it remotely now for a couple of years, and it's just not um, the same quality of, of session. Um, mm -hmm. But that that piece of actually practicing how you're going to speak with people uh, is is really important so that there's a, a non live <laughs> uh, training ground for it. Mm -hmm. um, but then the people that are are working on this do find it to be ben beneficial, but it does take uh, a change in how they approach mm -hmm. um, their their communications. Yeah, thank you. Sonia, there's a question for you. Uh, do we know much about the sex differences in low back pain among children and young people? Oh, uh, thank you for that question. Um, well, I, I know that there's a recent uh, review about changes in sex-related differences in low back pain throughout the lifespan. And um, I don't know it by heart, but I can send the, the, the reference um uh, to the person who made the question but um sex related differences start emerging in the pattern uh well uh, around puberty mm. um and so uh, for children there aren't much sex related differences in low back pain they start emerging around puberty um and then um they 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 increase again around the the ages of 
menopause. So uh, there's some evidence that um, sex hormones may play a role um, in accounting for those differences, but also, um, uh, well, puberty is also adolescent. So it's 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 the the a stage of life where we really are building up our gender identity. So that also may play a role. Uh, in those, um, in accounting for those sex-related differences. Sure. No, thank you. I look forward to receiving that paper from you so I can circulate that. Paulo, there's a question for you. Does a patient travel to the doctor or doctors come to patients in rural Australia? Hmm. I mean, that's that's an interesting question. Um, so most commonly um, people need to travel to see doctors, GPs, and primary care providers, and so on. Um, now, there are some, some initiatives of um, healthcare providers that actually do the opposite. And, and interestingly, sometimes this happens from private um, um, allied health practitioners and physios who set up um, you know, ways to actually travel to communities and, and, and people's farms and so on. Um, um, there are some also health districts initiatives where um, the healthcare team travels to small, smaller towns instead of just being concentrated on those major towns. Um, and every local health district has a different system. Um, and that's one of the things that we found a little bit uncoordinated when it comes to rural health. Um, you know, every Every region tends to do things differently. Every local health, at least in Australia, um, every local health district, you know, does telehealth in a different way, uses a different platform, or you know, has a different program. So it's it's really a kind of an uncoordinated, you know, a field. Um, but there are some great initiatives um, in in this in this area. But most commonly, people will have to travel. Um, Ivan might be in a better position to answer this as well. I think he's got much more experience than me. Sure. Ivan, do you have anything to add? What well, do you I mean, find? I think it varies so much. We've got a saying here, if you know one rural community, you know one rural community. Um, mm. and, and so I think things yeah. are very varied. Obviously, um, you know, you've got access to care is often lower. Um, that's so often compounded by people having to provide care to over greater geographical spread. And that's yeah. been compounded again by cyclical workforce shortages, at least in, in where I am. Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, it, it's highly variable. I don't think I don't think they have issues finding um, uh, health practitioners in the nice sort of wine growing regions <laughs> in Western Australia, at least. Um, yeah. A lot of the other areas, um, for some reason, are, are hard, but also yeah. very warm places to live. Yeah, it depends on the capacity of the medical care as well in that area. Yeah. Sonia, can I quickly ask you, um, you made a very valid point in your presentation that uh, most of the clinical trials are missing out on the opportunity to tease out sex and gender related, mm -hmm. you know, uh, analysis. What suggestions can you make to people who are planning on these trials? How can we avoid these loopholes? Yeah. Well, th th I think that's an excellent question. And indeed, um, sex and gender um, issues are still not being um, thoroughly thoroughly integrated in clinical trials. So my, my first, first suggestion is just to, um, well, a basic suggestion would be just start reporting sex-related differences, whether they're significant or not. That would be a great improvement in clin clinical trials. Um, uh, even if they're not significant, just adding, well, we, we just actually checked if the intervention is equally effective for men and women, and it, it is, and then we can uh, report the overall findings, is, is, it would be useful. Um, and, um, and, and then integrating gender is much more complex because of, of the complexity of the constructs involved. Yeah. Uh, my suggestion, well, currently there are many tools that help researchers integrate gender-related issues in their, uh, in their uh, research. 
Uh, one uh, site I, I highly recommend uh, is uh, um, a site uh, by Stanford University called Gendered Innovations. And it's an excellent website where they um, uh, uh, give you some of the topics or research or questions you should ask about your own research projects, whether uh, to help you understand if you're actually uh, integrating uh, gender in and if it makes sense to integrate gender in your own research. Um, um, and they give you excellent case studies to show how um, starting maybe to integrate gender in your research can can actually lead to great innovations in in your er, in your um, areas of research. Um, and uh, I don't know if I can ask a question <laughs> to my oh, colleagues uh, regarding this one, <laughs> sure. because I was really interested in your talks. And um, uh, one of the questions I had in my mind was. Uh, well, the first question to, to Dr. Ivan Lin was whether uh, your so uh, your um, uh, interventions, interventions you develop, the videos, and uh, if it, it, to which extent did you integrate or did you find and integrate any gender related um, um, uh, issues in the videos or? Uh, if you think there are differences in the way these interventions are effective to male to males and females, and um, that was a, a, a question I had in my mind, for example, I was very oh, curious okay. about that. <laughs> I think clearly I don't consider it enough, and it's been really nice to listen to your talk today, um, Sonia. So um, I, I guess we we developed five videos. Um, those videos were based on um, a qualitative research, as I think I said it's in the presentation. And so we had, um, and so there were sort of different demographics. So they targeted, uh, well, we targeted sort of um, a young man story, a young woman story, middle-aged man story, middle-aged woman story, and then community elders story. And that was really just through that process of, you know, using the qualitative research, um, going to our advisory groups and, and, and receiving some advice about what the important stories were. Um, yep. Yeah, but we, I mean, we didn't consider, well, we, we considered um, stories that could appeal to particularly important demographics. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Sonia and Ivan. Just in interest of time, I'm aware that we are a little bit over the time, but I would like to hear your thoughts, Cheryl. Uh, you did mention in your talk that often indigenous communities will fight it out or bear out their symptoms rather than approaching care. Do you think this racial sort of norms that indigenous people are more stoic have also contributed to limitation in research in this area? I do think so. I think that stereotype um, is pretty pervasive regardless of where you are in the world. And, um, and, and I think when people aren't presenting because they are avoiding the healthcare system for different reasons, it reinforces that healthcare stereo, uh, provider stereotype that there is a difference in how people are affected by pain or manage their pain. Um, but when you ask people, uh, for example, what, you know, is your arthritis impacting you? It, it is extremely significant, but mm -hmm. they are trying to um, deal with those past experiences. They are trying to fulfill all of the expected roles for them um, in our work. It's mostly women that will come and speak to us in their interviews. So they're saying, I'm busy caregiving. I'm busy trying to work. I'm busy trying to, to do everything people are asking of me. And then there's also other comorbidities that they have that will take prevalence since, or precedence. And so um, if you have a, a diabetic foot, um, that will probably be more important, important to address in that limited interaction you're willing to take, uh, as opposed to coming to speak about back pain. And then race, race um, also experience more stereotyping about being drug seeking or only looking for pain medications, which is another pretty common stereotype that we see here. Mm. No, so true. I think we also kind of observe that here in Australia as well. Thank you so much, uh, all of you. This is such a delightful experience to have such diversity on one panel. Thank you genuinely for coming out and representing this important determinants of health disparity. 
Uh, and a special thank you to Jeanette. Uh, I don't think I could have managed pulling off this uh, webinar without you. Thank you so much. Thank you to all the attendees for coming out and listening to us. If you have any questions, feel free to reach out to any one of us. Thank you, everyone. Take care. Bye. Thank you. Bye.